Hello, my name is Alex Kemeny and I work part-time at Trump's Bridge Centre in Sydney, Australia. Down there I direct bridge sessions and I also uh, look over supervised bridge sessions. I wanted to do this video uh, in order to familiarise people who may not understand how bridge clubs operate in terms of the way the game of bridge is played at a bridge club which will be quite different from the way you play bridge if you perhaps play at home with your friends or in a, in a less formal setting like in a golf club or, or, or a bowling club or some sort of um, scenario like that. The thing about playing bridge in a bridge club is, is it doesn't matter what cards you are dealt because the idea in a bridge club, the game of bridge being a, I guess an intellectual pursuit, is to find the person who has the most skill at playing the cards. And when it comes to skill, it shouldn't matter whether you dealt good cards or bad cards. And the game of contract bridge solves this problem in a very clever way by playing what we call duplicate. And duplicate means that the same hands are played multiple times in a session by all the different players. And by doing this, we can compare who is doing the best with the same cards. So I'll explain to you how a bridge club is laid out. Let's say we have a session of bridge where we have nine tables, which may seem like a lot if you're used to just playing bridge at home with your friends. You might only have one table or maybe two. Let's assume in a bridge club we've got nine tables of players who have turned up for play. Well, in a bridge club, the tables will be set out usually in some sort of circular or or in two lines, something like that. Here I've, here I've assumed that we've got nine tables and the tables are laid out like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So roughly forming a, a circle. So what happens when we sit down at, let's say we sit table one, and firstly in a bridge club, the other thing I should point out is that in a bridge club there is one designation of north. It doesn't have to be a true north, of course. But it's just usually there's a sign on the wall saying N, and it means that the people who sit here on this end of the room, the way I've set this room up, are called North. So there's a North at each of the tables. North, of course, partners South, and their opponents in the card play are East and West. So nine tables, 36 players, and we all sit down to play. Now, when you play a session of bridge in a bridge club, you don't spend the whole afternoon or the whole evening or whatever it is, morning, playing against the same opponents. You play a small number of hands against one set of opponents and then your opponents change. So in a nine table movement, we will usually play three hands, three deals I like to call it, or as we say in bridge clubs, three boards, and I'll tell you why it's called a board in a minute three boards or three deals against one opponent and then we will get a different opponent. So how does it work? The bridge director will put out, in this case we need 27 boards if we're playing nine tables and each table receives three boards. Boards one to three will go on table one, boards four to six on table two and so forth all the way around the room. Board nine will therefore receive boards 25 to 27. Again, slight slip of the tongue there. I should have said at table nine, they will receive boards 25 to 27 in the first round. The other thing I should mention, if I didn't make it clear, is that table one is considered to be next to table nine. So the highest number table, the next table up, is table one. So players, once they've finished at table nine, move up to the next table, we'll go back to table one. And similarly, the boards, when they're passed anti-clockwise, back from table one to the next lower number table, well, there is no lower number table from one, so they go back to the highest number table, table nine. So it's just as though the tables form a circle, with the players going clockwise to the next higher number table, and the boards generally running anti-clockwise to the next lower number table. Well, that's how we run it in Australia anyway. Now, as I mentioned, we play three board rounds against our opponents. So we'll play, let's say we're sitting at table one, where, let's say, east-west, I'm sitting east, my partner might be sitting west, our opponents are north and south. 
We'll play boards one, boards two, and boards three, and we will score those boards. And these days, scoring is done with a small electronic unit, but in the old days, we used to score on paper. It doesn't really make any difference. These days, it's all done electronically. We, we score the three, we play the three hands, we score the three hands, and then at the end of those three hands, normally about 21 minutes will be allotted by the director to play three hands, normally about seven minutes per hand. After 21 minutes, we should be finished our three hands, and the director will then say, okay, all move for the second round. Now, what happens then is that if we're sitting east-west in a Mitchell movement, which is the most basic movement in bridge clubs, and it's also by far the most common as well, east and west will get up and they will move to the next higher number table. So we will play our next three hands against the north-south pair that is sitting at table number two. And then after playing three more hands, the director will call move again and we'll move to the next table. So we play the first three boards, one to three, and we move to table two. Now, of course, the people at table two, the north-south pair, have already played board four to six. So what happens is the boards move the other way. So in the first round, boards one to three are here, boards four to six are here at table two, and boards seven to nine are at table three. What will happen is the director will say, east-west, move up one table, we'll move from one to two, and send the boards back the other way. So boards one to three in the second round will go over here to table nine. Boards seven to nine, which started off on table three, will come here to table two. So on round two, as east-west, where east-west we start at table one, we move to table two. In the second round, we will play the different north-south pair, and we will play boards seven to nine. Now, of course, for seven to nine have already been played at table three. So now we can compare the computer in these days, or in the old days, the director, when he scored manually, can be able to compare how well did north-south at table two versus us do on these hands seven to nine, which are precisely the same hands that were played in round one there. Again, at the end of the second round, we will move up to the next higher number table. The boards will come back. We'll now be playing in round one, two, three. We'll be playing at table three. We'll be playing the boards that started at table five in round three. So the boards that started at table five will come here in round two and here in round three. So we'll now be playing, as it happens, boards 13 to 15. And we proceed around the room and probably nine tables, 27 boards. That's a convenient number for a session. It takes about three hours to play 27 boards at about seven minutes per board, we'll play nine rounds of three. And the boards will all have been played nine times with different players playing them. And that's how the computer can score up the boards. So even if I'm sitting here in the east seat and I have really bad cards all day, it doesn't matter because all the other east players sitting in the same east seat have had the same in this case, maybe bad hands as me. So who's performed best on these particular hands? So it's very clever. It's called duplicate bridge because the scores are duplicated. The hand is replayed nine times in this particular scenario. Okay, so that gives you a broad outline of how the Mitchell movement works. The other thing I could have said and that I probably should have said is that it's normal for the north-south pairs to remain stationary. So they sit at the same table for the entire session. The east-west pairs only are the ones that move. The other thing that you may have realised from what I've said about the scoring is that, in fact, all the north-south pairs are the ones that are competing against one another, and the east-west pairs are also competing against one another. So when you sit down and play, as let's say east and west at table one, our real opponents aren't the people we're playing against, our real opponents are the same pairs, or the pairs I should say, sitting in the same direction as us at the other tables. So we're playing against all the different north-south pairs, but our scores will be compared against the other east-west pairs. So as I mentioned, we have a north-south winner and an east-west winner. 
Now there is a way, if the director wishes, for him to get just one winner and it involves something called an arrow switch which I won't cover here but that's not normal to happen in a bridge club unless for some reason you want only one winner. So the normal scenario is you have an east-west winner and a north-south winner. The other thing you may have noticed is that we have an odd number of tables here. What happens if we have an even number of tables? Let's say we have over here table number 10. Let me just draw it in there for the purposes of the discussion. Table number 10. For the mathematically inclined amongst you, you will have noticed that if there are 10 tables, then after we've moved, I think, five times as the east-west pair, one, two, three, four, five, the boards will have come one, two, three, four, five, we will strike the same boards that we played in round one once we get to table six. That will happen if there is an even number of tables. And to overcome that, when there is an even number of tables, the director will announce after the halfway point that you have to skip a table. So we'll, as pair one, we'll go to table two, three, four, five, and then we will skip to table seven so that we don't strike the same cards that we got in the first round. So in a 10 table, Mitchell, you'll play nine opponents at most and you will miss one opponent. That's so you don't, as I say, strike the same boards twice as east-west. That's called a skip Mitchell. Again, very standard, Not, nothing you have to worry about as a player. The director will tell you when and if there is a skip round. The other thing you might have happen is that you may have nine and a half tables, let's say. Let's say we don't have enough people, 38 people turned up to play. We haven't got enough to fill the 10th table. So at the 10th table, or usually it is the high number table, you'll have what's called a sit-out. So at the 10th table, there might be a missing pair, let's say east-west, are not present at table 10. In fact, let's make it north-south for the purposes of the discussion, because it's a little easier. There's no north-south pair at table 10. It just means in the first round, the east-west pair sit there and they don't have any opponents. They will then move to the next table when the round is called, and the pair that was at, pair at table 9, the east-west pair at table 9, they will move to table 10, where there's no north-south pair because the chairs are empty, and they will have a sit-out. So that applies when you have a half table. All it means is you don't play those three boards and the boards are averaged. Those three boards you just score on average because you didn't actually get to play them. Usually the director will let you look at the cards uh, just to fill in time. If you want to pretend you can bid the hands, pretend you are, you are playing the hands, but that's just optional. So that's what happens when there's a half table. So what I've told you so far is plenty enough to go on to go to a bridge club. I will just mention that there is a different type of movement available called a howl movement. Usually applies when there's a small number of tables. If we've got five tables, we can still play a Mitchell movement fairly well. Five rounds of five, five board rounds, you play each of the other five opponents in the same way as I described previously. But let's say we have only four tables, small game. Playing a four table is a bit funny. You play six board rounds. Seems like a pretty long round to play six boards against the same opponents. And that way you only have four north-south pairs and four east-west pairs competing. So, you know, if you win, you've come top out of four. There is a different way of playing that's usually used with a small number of tables. It's called a howl movement. With four tables, we can actually think that we have eight pairs rather than four tables. And so the howl movement is very clever. It involves every player, pair playing against every other pair. So sometimes you sit north-south, sometimes you sit east-west. Again, as a player, you don't have to worry. The director will set it up for you. Basically, you follow a special guide card that is placed on each table. After you finish playing each round, it tells you where to move in the next round. If you're sitting at one east-west, you look at your guide card at the end of round one and it says, OK, go to table three north-south. When you finish there, it'll take it, say, go to table four north-south. And then after that, you might move to two east-west. And it's very cleverly worked out. You'll always play different opponents in the seven rounds. Remember, eight pairs are present in a four-table movement. 
you'll play the other seven pairs, you'll probably play four boards against each of the other seven pairs, making a total of 28 boards. You won't ever meet the same board twice, you won't ever meet the same opponents twice. Very cleverly worked out, I guess by someone called Howell. Uh, and there we get only one winner, because of course now we're all competing against one another. Sometimes sitting east-west, sometimes sitting north-south. So that's a different type of uh, movement that's available. Now the next thing I wanted to do was to, uh, I'm going to cut the video here and set up at a card table and we'll have a look at how play occurs in a bridge club which is different probably to the way you play at home. The way we play in a club is critical to us being able to replay the hands later. So I'm going to cut this now and the next take is going to start immediately for you. Okay, hi. Well here's a card table. This is what a table would look like in a bridge club, maybe except that we'd probably have four pens on the table rather than one, one for each player. There's always a table number on the table which is put out by the director at the start of play, depending on how many tables he's chosen for play and where he or she has decided to place the table. So here we have table number six. Normally it's a laminated card. I've printed one here on plain paper just for demonstration purposes. So if this is table 6, and if we are having three board rounds, as I mentioned earlier, we'd expect to find boards 16, 17 and 18 sitting on table 1. On table 6, I should say, in round 1. So let's just take a look at one of these boards. Board 16, the first board we're going to play. As you can see, there are four pockets with the cards inside them. You can see the, the board number. It's always written to, fa to face north, if you like. So. There's your 16 when you face it up towards north. It's not really 91. As you can see, the compass positions, which are slightly blurred in the camera there, but north, south, dealer, and east. So dealer is west on board 16. And the vulnerability is shown by the fact that east, west have red and north, south don't. They north, south have green. So on board 16 all over the world, you'll find that west is always the dealer and the vulnerability is always east-west vulnerable, north-south not. So these boards are usually dealt by computer. This wallet opens up and is put into the dealing machine and the cards are dropped into the slot by the dealing machine. The wallet's then folded back over and the board's ready for play. So we take the other boards off the table and get ready to play board 16. Here's the bidding pad. Some clubs use what are called bidding boxes, which are like pre-printed bids of every possible bid, and you select the bid that you want. So if you want to bid one heart, you select the one heart card, and bidding proceeds uh, in that way. But with bidding boxes, what we have here is an area for South to show their bids, West, North, and East. There's a slightly heavier dark line around the area that belongs to you. A little bit hard to see on the camera there, but I hope you can get a good enough picture of the way it looks. So, it's usually best not to mark the bidding boxes. Some people will do this. West is the deal, and put that to indicate that east-west is the vulnerability. I don't like doing that, and in many clubs that's frowned upon, for the simple reason that someone can mark it wrongly, and then someone may make the wrong open, or the wrong person may make the opening bid or the vulnerability might be marked incorrectly. It's shown on the bidding uh, on the board what the uh, vulnerability in the dealer is so it's better not to do that. I'm going to rip that away so we start with a nice fresh uh, bidding pad. So they have two sides to them so you can use them and then discard them after they've been used on both sides. So obviously what will happen at the table is that each player will take their cards out and sort their hand into suits as usual, just the same way as you would do at home. So I'll just do that now. And then we're going to all make our bids according to what we think our hands are worth. So Okay, so I've positioned the camera differently now so we can see the bidding pad quite clearly. Each tape player will obviously remove their cards from the wallet. We'll look at their cards in the normal way. I'm just going to take the cards away here. So all four cards are now out of the wallet. 
as we can see the dealer is West so West will start the bidding if you do not wish to bid so just to put a highlight here this is the area for West bidding with the bold line around it that I've made a little bit more bold now West will they put, normally put their bids, first bid here, second bid, third bid, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth bid. I've never seen anyone need more than eight bids to bid a hand. So, West might choose to pass. You just pass by putting a slash across the spot where your next bid is due. So now it's North's turn to bid. Let's suppose North chooses to bid one spade. So you write one S. One spade. East might decide that they have a takeout double on this hand. If you wish to double, you do it like this. You put a great big cross in your bidding box. Now it's South's turn to bid. Let's say that South decides that they want to make a redouble on this hand. So you redouble just by putting two crosses there. At this point, let's say West chooses to bid two clubs. So there we are, two clubs, and now North might choose to bid, so let's say, two hearts. Now maybe East West had decided to sign off from the auction, pass, maybe South will now bid, I don't know, three clubs. I haven't even looked at the cards, I'm just doing this in, oh, let's say three diamonds, seeing they've already, the East West already bid clubs. Three diamonds, pass, and now north makes a bid that we're all quite used to when we're playing pairs. Three no trumps. Looks like north might have a hand with the majors here and a stop ring clubs. And south has got some sort of strongish hand with diamonds. When you're the third person to pass, it's normal to pass like this. Put a double slash to indicate that's the end of the auction. So just to have a bit of a closer look at the bidding pad, there it is. Okay. The bids for West are delineated by the extra dark lines. It's not so obvious here, but it's very obvious when you sit at the table where your uh, area is on the bidding pad. So, now let's play the hand. I'll do that via another take so we can get to see the whole table. Okay, so the auction for board 16 is over now. The auction has been won by North with a bit of three no trumps. East is on lead. East will select their lead card. Now, at home, we will be used to tossing our cards into the middle. At that point, dummy will come down. Trumps, if any, will be placed on the right. Don't know if you do that at home, but that's always done in bridge cards. Trumps, if any, on the right. Cards can be placed, the suits can be placed in any order. The cards should be sorted by rank. You may not be able to see the cards from home, but it doesn't matter. So at home, we'd be tossing the cards in the middle as we play at our hands. We don't do that in a bridge club. In a bridge club, when you play your card, you put it down in front of you. And this is essential to allow us to reconstruct the hands later. I'm just going to open the other defender's hands. I know you probably can't see the cards, but it doesn't matter just for the purposes of displaying how the play proceeds. The leads are two of hearts, in case you can't see it. The contract's three no trumps. So the card is placed face down in front of you. Of course, I've just shown the open hands here. In real life, everyone will be holding their hands here, except for dummy, which is, is exposed. Now, the Clara, rather than play the card by reaching for a, in a bridge club, dummy stays seated at the table, and the Clara will say, low, please or low heart, the dummy player will then follow directors, the, uh, the uh, declarer's command and will play the card requested. So here the dummy's played the eight of hearts. It so happens that uh, West can't beat that. He'll put out the seven of hearts and declarer might play a low card as well, the nine of hearts. So the, the card has been won by dummy with the eight of hearts. So when the trick is completed, which it is now, Everybody turns the card over in front of them. The trick is done. At home, we have the four cards in the middle of the table, and whoever won the trick, or whichever side won the trick, would collect the cards 
and place the trick in front of them. We don't do that in a bridge club. We all turn over our cards and we turn them over in a certain way. In fact, I'm going to start that on the left, which is what I usually do when I'm in a club. You've noticed we've turned the cards over facing a certain way. If you win the trick, you turn the card over so it is standing up. So the trick's been won by the north-south, card faces that way. East-west place their card the same way, lying down from their point of view. So the cards always face the same way. So we can see here that the first trick has been won by north-south. Maybe at trick two, the Clara selects the king of spades, which is played. This pan plays a spade, Clara plays a spade, and at this point East might decide they're going to win their ace of spades. So East will take their ace of spades, at that point the trick is turned over in the same fashion. The card faces the side that has won the trick. So at this point we've won one trick each. Maybe at this point, it uh, might not be a very good play, but let's say East decides to cash their ace of hearts, plays their ace of hearts, dummies jack, Little one from west, the Clara has to play one of their two remaining honours. Nevertheless, the trick's been won by east-west. Again, the card is placed in this way. So we can see now that east-west have won two tricks, the Clara has won one. Let's say for the purposes of the exercise that uh, they continue with another heart, small, dummy discards something, the Clara falls for the two of diamonds from dummy, discarded. This person plays there a little heart, and the Clara wins his trick with the king. So now we've won two tricks each. At that point, after those three cards are turned over, East might say, oh no, sorry, I didn't see. Sorry, it was too quick, I couldn't see. Would you please turn your cards back? East, or any player, except for Dunny, is allowed to request a review of the last trick. East hasn't turned his card of the three of hearts over, so when he says, no, sorry, may I see the cards again? All cards have to be redisplayed. Thank you. Cards are turned back in the correct orientation. Two tricks each at this point. East has now turned their card over. East nor can no longer request to see the last trick because by turning his card over, he's acknowledged that he's happy that he's seen that last trick. East is allowed to look at his own last card quite um, just for his own benefit. But nobody's allowed to look at earlier tricks, what are called quitted tricks. They must re remain covered. So let's say the play continues and Declara ends up winning a few more tricks. So wins all these and maybe loses a couple at the end and wins the last couple. And so at the end of the play, the cards are all lined up like this. So it's very easy to see that four tricks were lost by Declara and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine were won. At that point, it's a good idea to say nine tricks, we all agreed. At that point when we're all agreed, you then collect your cards, give them a little shuffle, just so the next people can't see what order the tricks might have been played in, in case they're looking for that. Not that important, but uh, it is nice et etiquette just to give your cards a small shuffle before putting them back into the wallet. And this is how the cards go back into the wallet and are played by the next people in the next round. It's important therefore not to foul the board by wrongly putting a card into a pocket where it doesn't belong. Important to put the cards back into their correct pocket. And that brings me to another, quick, another point, which I'll talk about in a minute. So at this point we've agreed on nine tricks. The cards have been put back in the wallet. We'll score up the hand on the electronic scorer. I don't have one here but they're all different in different bridge clubs, so it doesn't matter too much. They're a little bit like smartphones, they're not very hard to use. If you're not familiar and you go to a bridge club for the first time, I'd advise you to sit east-west, because south normally does the scoring, or sometimes north, but north-south manage their scorer. East-west just have to check on the scorer that the correct score went in. So at first, when you're not sure about using uh, score, uh, electronic scoring, best to sit east-west, and that way you'll only be required to check. The machine will show that, for instance, on this hand, three no trumps making nine tricks, plus 400 will come up automatically. So the bidding pad's turned over, and the next board is put on the table. Talking about fouling boards, it's always a good idea, in fact, it's 
is actually required in bridge cops. When you get your hands out of the board, you count your cards. Usually just like that. 13 cards, I'm happy, I look at them. If you happen to have the wrong number of cards, you can call the director and the director can fix the board before you've looked at your cards. If you look at your cards, it can be too late to fix the board, particularly if you have 14 cards, you've seen a card that you should not have seen. So that's just another little idea. Um, well, it's, it's required actually in bridge clubs for you to count your cards. So this is a technique we use in bridge clubs to bid hands, play hands, and to enable the hands to be replayed at the next table in the next round. So I think that gives you plenty to go on in terms of how to play at a bridge club. I hope that the video has been informative and I hope that uh, you know, I haven't made anything unclear. If anything is unclear, you're most welcome to send me uh, a, uh, a message via YouTube and I will endeavour to answer your question. Okay, well thank you for watching the video and happy bridging and do go along to that local bridge club. Don't be scared. I'm sure you will be given a warm welcome. Thank you for watching. Bye.